Okay, welcome back everybody. So we're going to enter this second half of the afternoon um, actually with a, a mindfulness session, uh, which is going to be led by Marcus from Mind in Salford. Hello, me again. Um, yeah, I was so busy organising this event over the last few weeks with James and everybody. I suddenly thought two days ago, crap, I've got to actually do deliver things on the day, so <laughs> here I am again. So we're going to do a short 10 minute mindful breathing practice. Um, we've talked a lot about mindfulness today, so now we're going to actually do some mindfulness. So I'd like you just all to kind of uh, get comfortable in your seat and uh, just sit with your feet flat on the floor. Um, you can have your, the palms of your hands face down on your lap, or you can just let them hang loosely in your lap, just so your shoulders can rest down a little bit. <coughs> and just sitting upright, but not rigid, so you're just allowing your spine to follow its natural curves. And then closing your eyes if that feels okay, or you can have an unfixed gaze on the floor or the chair in front of you. And we're just going to come into our bodies, so firstly just noticing the sensation of the soles of the feet against the floor. Just noticing that connection, that physical sensation. Noticing the connection with your foot and your sock or your shoe. And then just taking your attention to the sensation of your body in the chair. Those points of connection with your skin and the chair that you're sitting in. And just seeing if you can give your weight up to the chair, just allowing the chair to take your whole weight. And just allowing your face to be soft, allowing your forehead to be smooth with no frowning, allowing your jaw to be soft. Allowing your throat to be soft, allowing your throat to be full of stillness, full of silence. And I'm just going to invite you to drop in on your breath, just dropping in on the sensations of the breath in the body as you sit here breathing in and out. So I'm not changing the breath in any way, just allowing the breath to breathe itself as it always does. So breathing in and knowing that you're breathing in, breathing out and knowing that you're breathing out. So just being in touch with the felt sensation of the breath. So we're not imagining the breath or visualizing it or thinking about it. We're just trying to come up close to the felt sensations of the breath in the body. Just seeing if we can rest in the breath. And our minds will wander hundreds of times while we're doing this practice, because that's what our minds do. And all we're trying to do is just notice when our mind wanders away from the breath, and in a kind but firm way, bringing it back to rest on the sensations of the breath in the body. Over and over, 
without judging yourself, without telling yourself off. Now I'm going to invite you just to notice where you feel the breath the most vividly in your body. Could be in your belly, your lungs, your chest, your back. Just noticing where the breath is most vivid for you in your body. And resting your attention just as much as you can on that place. Just noticing. When the mind wanders away, just notice in a kind but firm way, bringing it back to rest on this place where you feel the breath the most vividly. And just seeing if you can notice the quality of the breath in this place. Noticing if the breath is more vivid on the in-breath or more vivid on the out-breath. And where is your mind right now? Just noticing. And if it's wandered away to the past or the future or just been tangled up in present moment thoughts, just noticing this in a kind but firm way, escorting the attention back to rest on that place in your body where you feel the breath the most vividly. Just resting here in the breath, in this body, in this room, in this moment. And now just taking your attention back to the sensation of your body against the chair. The points of contact of your body with the chair. And moving your attention down your body to the soles of your feet. Just noticing the sensation of the soles of the feet against the firm floor. Becoming more aware of the sounds inside the room and the sounds outside of the room. Perhaps even noticing the sensation of your clothes against your skin. And noticing the skin on the face, the air temperature on the skin on the face, is it warm or cold or somewhere in between? And then as we bring this practice to a close, in your own time, just gently opening your eyes.
Thank you. It's quite an amazing sight, seeing 130 people all quiet and still and calm. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Mark, for joining that session. Uh, I'd now like to uh, welcome and hand over to Jamie Bristow, Director of the Mindful Initiative, uh, which helped the Mindfulness All Party Parliamentary Group to conduct the inquiry uh, and produce the report. So, thank you, Jamie. Uh, there will be a 10 minute Q&A uh, after Jamie, uh, so please do bear in mind any questions you have. Thank you very much, James. Thank you very much, Marcus. That was, that was really nice. I think I might insist on a 10-minute meditation before I do any kind of public speaking, I have to say. Uh, I feel um, more grounded, perhaps, than, uh, than I normally do. So I, I thought I'd um, start by offering a, a definition of mindfulness, one that is, is offered in this report as well, because the word is used so much, and it's used to, to mean different things. So a kind of broad trend or a, um, a kind of culture. Uh, but one that I find really useful is, is as a, a capacity, a natural human capacity that we all have. In fact, Yogesh talked about it as something that we're, we're kind of born with. Um, and we can all be somewhat mindful, even if we've never heard of mindfulness. Uh, and, and some of the evidence is showing that the degree to which we are able to be aware of what's going on in our minds without necessarily getting carried away with it, is associated with lots of positive things. So the more mindful among us tend to be better decision makers, tend to be more resilient, resilient to psychological distress. And we can, we can choose to cultivate mindfulness. And there's rightly debate about what the best way of cultivating it is. And we've heard um, about how some of, the, some of the needs that different groups have um, when uh, they can't necessarily do a uh, 45-minute practice a day. And so we need more evidence about what is the most effective way of cultivating it and who it is most effective for and who it's not effective for and who it's not appropriate for at certain times of people's, in times of people's lives. So uh, I'll, I'll come to kind of the overarching findings of the report, but that's definitely one of them, uh, the, the need to kind of raise the evidence base and the kind of granularity or the, the nuances that, we, uh, they were, that we're yet unclear about in terms of um, yeah, who and where and what should be taught. So uh, this report, um, Mindful Nation UK, widely regarded as a kind of significant global milestone, uh, really. It's the first document of its kind anywhere in the world that we're aware of, um, a, a document that takes mindfulness seriously as a matter of public policy. And that, it, it's kind of, uh, we have to pinch ourselves that we've kind of got this far, really. And, and only sort of two or three years ago, it, it would be crazy. It, it was crazy of us, we felt, to embark on the process. Uh, and even crazier to, 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 to expect three government ministers to turn up to the, and speak at the, uh, the launch of the report in, in Westminster. So it's the result of a 12-month of a inquiry by the Mindfulness All-Party Parliamentary Group, supported by uh, a group of um, uh, experts and, and, and other volunteers like myself. Um, and uh, the, yeah, the Westminster launch was, was very well uh, attended uh, and it sort of uh, has enabled us to have a national policy conversation, talking to civil servants, talking to, to charities and other third sector groups uh, and, and talking to, to government ministers. So we've been, Nikki Morgan, the Secretary of State for Education, spoke at the launch. We're now in um, uh, dialogue with her about the recommendations in the report. And Alistair Burt, the, the Minister for, for, for Mental Health, similarly spoke very warmly about mindfulness, was reading sections of the report back to us, uh, particularly in the area of, of long-term health conditions uh, and things like physical pain, uh, irritable bowel syndrome and, and, and cancer, which we, we, we asked um, NICE to, to review the evidence for um, in, in the report. Uh, but this is, it's nice that we've got this kind of national platform, but really where, where most of the work will be done and where, it, where, it, where it's of most importance, really, that, that the message gets heard is at the local level. So that's why it's really important that events like this are taking place and that people like uh, organisations like Breathworks and Mind are doing really the, the hard work in, in, in pulling this together. Um, we'll have around 12 launch events around the country. Um, and uh, it's really important for a number of reasons. Firstly, 
we've got to where we are now in terms of the understanding of mindfulness and the access to it because of because it's a grassroots movement, because it's individual champions that have been talking about it and sharing it with other people. And it's kind of it's appeared where it's appeared because of those individuals. Um, so it will continue to be, uh, be, be the case. Uh, it's also, in, healthcare and education particularly are increasingly um, devolved services uh, in, in the UK. And so talking to individual trusts, talking to local clinical commissioning groups and um, uh, multi-academy schools trusts uh, who hold the, the, the influence and the money now is a very difficult job for, for, for you know, mind, people who are talking about mindfulness next to pharmaceutical companies that have something like 17 billion uh, at their disposal for, for marketing and, and lobbying. So it's very difficult for us to have this kind of influence on a very devolved scale without really engaged and um, uh, yeah, lo local organisations and individuals. And, and mindfulness really can't be uh, a top-down thing. It, 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 no one can order any de uh, department or, or public service to do it. It, ha it has to have, be, be based in understanding um, uh, uh, of individual practitioners. So um, the, uh, the, we're, we're going into now the fourth year of teaching mindfulness in Parliament to MPs and peers. 130 or so politicians have been through or are currently on the mindfulness training program. And it was really out of this experiential understanding that they became interested in the policy implications. And that we've now sort of, um, we're now seeing fledgling policy programs around the world in France, in Germany, Holland, European uh, Parliament, uh, Mexico, Canada. And, and, and what, we're, what we're saying is it really has to, first of all, be, be, um, be established in a kind of teaching program. Um, and uh, and I, so at, we, we started presenting the evidence in 2013. 2014 formed the All-Party Parliamentary Group and started this inquiry <coughs> process and launched the report in October. <coughs> so I'll just give you a, a, a sense of the findings. Um, overall, across all the policy areas we looked at, which were education, criminal justice, uh, healthcare, and the <coughs> workplace, uh, there was a common theme that... Uh, there needs to, there, there's all this tremendous amount of early research, pilot studies, evaluative studies, two or three papers coming out on average a day, something like that. Um, but really it's time to raise the quality of evidence, move up the kind of ladder of, of evidence um, hierarchy. And that isn't because researchers are being lazy and doing poor quality trials because it's easier, but because of funding. And we're calling upon funding bodies across these different areas to, to, to now build on this early um, amount of research and make sure we know what we're talking about. Uh, so there are issues with access, um, but, but also variability. Variability in training quality, teacher training quality, and understanding of best practice. Mindfulness means very different things to different people. It can be the simplest sort of mindful pause, which might have some value for people, but you can't point to the evidence base and say it's going to you know, lead to long-term ch changes in compassion or, or decision-making <coughs> skills if all you're doing is a 30-second 30 30 practice. Um, so we're, we're calling on a better understanding of, 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 of what, uh, yeah, what, what high-quality training is um, and, and, and access to teacher treat, treat training. Uh, looking at health, so um, mindfulness-based uh, cognitive therapy has been on the, uh, recommended by NICE since 2004. Um, and using figures from the King's Fund, we've shown that it could save 15 pounds for every pound spent in terms of future healthcare costs. Um, and that's, that's just pu cost to public services rather than society uh, as a whole. 72% of GPs would like to refer people, their patients to MBCT, but only one in five uh, know where to find that training. Um, and we think that, that there are probably a no, the, uh, the number of uh, clinically trained mindfulness teachers to, to serve about 4.3% of the uh, almost 600,000 people who are at risk of recurrent depression uh, in any given year. Um, and so we'd like to see that going from, you know, three or four, it's probably less actually, three or four percent uh, up to something where, where the IAPT program is pegged at 15% coverage for those at risk. Um, so it could be an option, as well as antidepressants is an option, use of which has increased by 500% in 20 years, um, next to uh, antidepressants for those who want it. 
And it, sadly, it's just not an option in, in, in many areas, or most areas, perhaps. Depression is two or three times more likely um, amongst people who have long-term health conditions, long-term physical health conditions. 15 million people in the UK, 70% of uh, healthcare spending is on long-term conditions like, like these. And the impact of poor mental health amongst those people is likely to be costing £8 billion a year. Um, so mindfulness, which is a mind-body technique, potentially has um, much to contribute in this area, as Alastair Burke, was quite, quite, uh, the, um, the Minister for Mental Health, was quite excited about. And some meta-analyses are showing that, it, that, that, that um, there's, there's the support there. Um, so we're calling for MBCT to be included with the, in, in, within the Improving Access to Psychological Therapies program, IAPT, um, both teacher training and, uh, and service provision. And there is some, it sounds like that that, that, that argument is, is, is finding uh, some, some traction, so watch this space. And we're also saying that MBCT should be available within physical health pathways. In education, there's been a tremendous amount of interest. So we have now have over 2,000 teachers trained to teach young people. Um, but there are high barriers, particularly financially. And so we're not suggesting that there should be any kind of um, top-down diktat or, cu or curriculum um, in in inclusion. But the Secretary of State for Education and the Department um, for Education uh, can catalyze or support a lot of this enthusiasm and innovation that's going on um, by helping with, with funding and uh, supporting schools that would like to be teaching schools, leading best practice, teaching others, driving innovation. In the workplace where there's perhaps been the most interest, experimentation <coughs> and media coverage, um, but uh, where evidence is most patchy, um, there's exciting evidence around a whole range of things, cognitive skills, um, resilience, um, but compared to health, for instance, the, the standard of evidence is still, is still quite low. Um, we're calling on funders to, to um, conduct high quality trials um, and for the government to take a lead as an employer in, in, in uh, um, implementing best practice uh, mindfulness training. And we now actually have a, a working group of, of civil servants from across government departments and senior levels working together to, to work out how that, how that recommendation um, might be implemented. But as has been mentioned today, we, are, we also highlight that mindfulness should never be a sticking plaster in a toxic environment. And there's a real danger for a bit of a kind of um, a backlash <coughs> and, re and resistance to, to what the profound impact that mindfulness could have if it's being used uh, in an unethical way. Uh, finally, in criminal justice, where uh, by one study, 80% of offenders have problems with self-regulation, so problems with dealing with impulses and, and, and emotional difficulties, which could let, you know, have led them to get, be in trouble in the first place. Uh, mindfulness could play a role in, in helping them stay out of trouble in the future, but also uh, increasing well-being. And it's lovely to hear that the, the National Offender Management Service, the part of the civil service responsible for looking after prisons, really f uh, feels that mindfulness has a role just in improving well-being uh, by itself, but is also interested in, in, in reduction in reoffending rates. Uh, and in this population where um, uh, I think it's 41% uh, by one study have had some kind of childhood abuse or trauma, um, mindfulness-based cognitive therapy, which has been shown to be most effective amongst those who have had childhood abuse or trauma and also more at risk of suicide um, also, uh, MBCT is more most effective for that group. And so in, in service, in the prison service, where MBCT, MBCT is almost completely unavailable, um, it could be um, more effective than antidepressants or the other things that, that, that are on offer. Um, and potentially offenders, I suppose, would also have time uh, to, to uh, <laughs> engage with the longer demands uh, of practice. And I mean, joking aside, we are hearing that... that, that um, uh, it, is, it, it is really popular amongst a group that deals with a lot of personal suffering and that, and that suffering can lead to transformative change in a way that with other groups um, it takes a bit, a bit more get, um, familiarity with mindfulness to, to get to. So I'll just finish with, um, with perhaps a longer term um, perspective. Uh, this report is a policy document. Uh, it is supposed to be uh, realistic and, and, and considered and costed and really looking at a, a three to five year horizon uh, 
about how a promising field can be developed sustainably, <coughs> uh, how we can raise the evidence, um, uh, the bar with evidence, how we can raise the bar with teacher training, uh, and how we can overcome some of the funding obstacles. And that was most, that, that was amongst the MPs and, and peers who were involved in the process, that was the kind of prevailing view that that's, that's what we needed to create right now. But that, there is also uh, a real sense amongst that group of politicians um, that there's something perhaps more fundamental, foundational even, uh, in, in how mindfulness could be, um, could cut right across society and, and, and contribute to, um, to flourishing as, as individuals and, and, and as a group. And in one of those ways, I'll just finish with a, with a little anecdote, and that's MPs talk about the Parliament as being a kind of antagonistic and aggressive environment, as you might expect, even within party politics, uh, within parties. But when they take time out, cross-party, so you've got SNP and Lib Dems and MP, uh, Conservative and, and, and Labour, uh, to engage in a different way, with a different tone, with different language, talking about emotions, um, intentions, uh, talk about what's most important to them, in the spiritual even. When they go out into the corridors of power and they see somebody else that they were in a class with and they talk to them, they tend to talk to them with that new tone, with softness, with care, with openness. And they say that, the people who are with them walking down the corridor, who haven't necessarily been in my mindfulness class, sort of adapt to that new tone. So there's a bit of a halo effect in and around the people who take the class. And that has been reported in the workplace as well. So it isn't just those who take the time to, to practice who might adapt you know, and might adapt this new way of looking at things. Uh, and, and John Crudus MP, who's a very influential Labour Party, John Crudus MP, who, uh, who's a very influential Labour Party politician, says that uh, mindfulness could be yeah, a foundational proposition across uh, almost all sort of policy areas because we're essentially talking about something, uh, awareness, uh, and the qualities we bring to that awareness, which impact everything we do, all the relationships that we have, and could unlock, uh, our, better unlock our human potential to, to learn and to grow and to become wiser because we have more, we can see more, we have more information to go on, to learn from, moment to moment in our hearts and minds. Uh, and, and that could really change things. So I'll leave it there. Uh, we are hoping to continue with a, an, an agenda of inquiry uh, under the auspices of the um, Mindfulness All-Party Parliamentary Group. Uh, so we'll have probably future hearings, looking in more detail at some of the policy areas here, uh, potentially some of the new policy areas as well. I'd love to take questions now if you have any, uh, if they could sort of focus on the policy areas or um, yeah, the policy or the, or the process, and that would be really helpful for now. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name's Ruth. Um, uh, I work at Manchester Mind on a resilience programme. And I have a long-term condition myself. I have an inflammatory arthritis. And when I went to my GP to ask for some help with that, she just told me about painkillers. Now, that was 10, 11 years ago. And I sent myself and I paid for myself to go to Breathworks, which changed my life. Um, I run resilience courses in Manchester. And we've really struggled to engage GPs to refer people onto our courses. So what I'm interested in policy is how that's going to trickle down to a GP in a practice who's going to think and know about and signpost people or refer people onto courses like ours and courses like Soul for Minds. Yeah, unfortunately it's a messy business and it's getting messier because of this devolution trend which has many, many advantages but one of them is, is, um, is about communication um, for uh, groups uh, and services, interventions like this. So there is a, an Aspire um, a project called the Aspire Project, um, which is NHS funded, um, collabor collaborations from a number of universities, including Oxford and, and Exeter, uh, about to report back. In fact, one of their um, uh, reporting sessions is tomorrow in, in, in Oxford, looking at the state of 
of, of, of mindfulness provision around the country, um, focusing on, on recurrent depression, but also looking at um, the, the other options. And that would be really helpful to see what, what the picture is. Um, having, having support from, from the national organisations, like the, the um, uh, and ministers, is, is, is helpful, and having nice guidance is helpful. So, um, but, but ultimately, the, whether you have provided it locally is, is down to trusts and clinical commissioning groups, um, and whether, you're, whether your GP is, is, is aware of that. So, so first of all, um, we need to yeah, get, get national support. Um, we need to ask NICE to review evidence, particularly around chronic pain. Um, and then once that happens, potentially over the next couple of years, um, then there's a yeah, then there's kind of a, a lobbying program, um, which which will happen internally in the NHS anyway. But there are potentially a role for, for groups like ours to facilitate that process. Um, yeah, sorry, I can't, can't be more succinct than that, but it's you know, like I say, messy. Shadow and Grove from the Centre of Mindful Life Enhancement, Sheffield. Um, one of the things you said that uh, you would tell us was that who it was most effective for, and I think you've told us very well about that. But you also said you would tell us about who it is not appropriate for. Could you say some more about that, please? Yeah. Uh, well, in mindfulness teacher training, um, one of the things that is, should be included, included is a kind of checklist of, um, of, of things that you should look out for when you're doing an assessment pre-course. Uh, and and that, that checklist include, um, have you had a bereavement in the last two years? If you had, well, you know, it's not a definite, you can't do the course, but we'll talk about it, and it's probably, probably not the right time. Um, so, and, and there are other very common things that we all go through, which mean it might not be the right time for us. There are also other groups um, for whom it might not ever be the right time, or at least MBSR and the ways that it's taught in a kind of, um, the, the uh, standardized course might not be appropriate. And one of those groups is uh, those suffering with PTSD. Uh, the evidence is, is kind of, um, is, is split on this bit, but it, it sounds like, uh, it's not that mindfulness isn't helpful, but unadapted mindfulness courses might, 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 be, might cause difficulty. And so the mindfulness-based mind fitness training that's used with the US Marines, for instance, both to respond to PTSD and to make US Marines uh, more resilient to it, uh, includes something called somatic experiencing, which is about using the body and, and body-based practices to, pr to process trauma. So that's one example where it might actually be dangerous for people to do it without that element included because of the way the body locks up traumatic experience and can release it, mm. often in quite scary ways. Mm. Um, and without a framework to understand that, it can be dist you know, uh, distressing. Um, so it's one of the things I think that perhaps we need to be clearer about um, and sort of talk loudly about the evidence behind um, where it's not so helpful as, as much as we talk about the evidence for where it is helpful. Um, because traumatic experiences and negative experiences reported uh, in, in, you know, in the media um, will, will, will be very, uh, uh, um, uh, yeah, will, will not be helpful. Have I got just a couple more minutes? How are we doing time? <coughs> time there's, there's one in the back there. Sure. Hi, my name is Amity Shiri. Chaplain at Manchester Royal, and I've led some courses for staff there. Uh, you mentioned in the government in the corridors that uh, staff, uh, part, members of parliament who participated in the courses, uh, talked to one another with that sort of tender way or a way that had a, a tone of meaning, <coughs> connecting with that, a more spiritual view. What, what's your um, feelings about uh, the connection between it being mindfulness as a clinical intervention or mindfulness as a spiritual intervention? How, do we, how are we inclusive in relation to bringing that into the workplace? I think there's something very interesting going on as a society at the moment where um, we live in a kind of, some people's termed it, in, in, including um, Rowan Williams actually, the Archbishop, termed Britain as a kind of post-Christian society. Um, we are um, an increasing like a pick and mix spiritual spirit, I mean, Something like 70% of people say that they're not religious, but in some way spiritual. Uh, and, and, we're, and we're not quite sure where to find answers or, or frameworks for that, 
for that natural desire to ask big questions um, and, and, and formulate answers to them. Uh, and, and so, um, so some people use, use mindfulness to explore those questions because you can tune into your, your emotions, your heart, mind, and some, and some of those unanswerables in, in, in a sort of more refined and attuned way. Uh, I think that um, the, 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 however, discussion of, of, of the spiritual <coughs> isn't a natural step from mindfulness that I've heard from mindfulness mm -hmm. teachers, um, and that we shouldn't uh, assume that that's what people are, are wanting or are wanting to explore. When questions come up, it's, it's often incorporated into, uh, into the discussion. Um, but the, the relationship between um, the secular practice and the human capacity of mind um, and the traditions in which it has been most em in, um, emphasised and cultivated uh, is, is a very sort of dynamic one and there's, there's a lot of learning um, to, to go on. But I think for the long-term sustainability um, of the field, I think it's really important to, to have a clear distinction um, between one as a spiritual inquiry and the other um, as a kind of psycho-educational framework for exploring and understanding our minds better. Does that answer your question? Sort of. <laughs> Somewhat. <laughs> Somewhat. It's a really difficult question. And uh, I, I really... There's, there's a report by the RSA um, on spirituality that came out last year. It's really fascinating read about the 21st century spirituality in, in, in British society. Um, and that, that, that sort of explores a lot of these issues. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you to the audience for those three questions. Did you say you, you'd like another yeah. minute? To yeah, if, you, if there is one. Some, not really. But not really. I'm, I'm, I, I, I'm just aware that there are some, there are some police officers in, 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 in the room. And I, 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 uh, I worked on the criminal justice part of the inquiry and spoke to a lot of police officers. Um, and and I have also recently spoke to kind of US not, um, armed, armed forces um, personnel. Um, and there's, there's something, and it's not, our findings weren't really put in this report because of the need for brevity, um, but there's some really interesting stuff about cascading emotions interfering with performance uh, under very stressful circumstances and the ability to um, sort of de-escalate that kind of cascade uh, in the moment can have something really important to say about performance and also about resilience to trauma. Um, so if you're interested, dro drop me a line email address on the back of the report, I can send you that, that, that information. Thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you, Jamie. Thank you for coming to the <laughs>speaking um, about chronic pain and long-term health conditions. So I just wanted to um, highlight now, and this is great following on from Jamie, just the cost to society of us continuing to do things uh, as they have been done historically. So uh, this is all from the long-term health conditions compendium I mentioned earlier. So right now, long-term health conditions account for 50% of all GP appointments. 64% of outpatient appointments and 70% of all inpatient bed days. So in total, that's 70% or seven pounds out of 10 of the total health and care spend in England, um, which, is about, which means that 30% of the people account for about 70% of the spending, which is pretty staggering. Um, and then from the report, from the... Um, Mindful Nation report, 
just this link um, that the Minister of Mental Health was also highlighting. Um, so depression is two to three times more common in people with long-term physical health conditions. Um, and people with two or more LTCs are seven times more likely to have depression. So how can mindfulness help? Um, we recently at Breathworks finished an independent study conducted by an outside consultancy that showed almost savings of almost six pounds for every dollar, or sorry, every pound. That was the American me coming out. <laughs> um, it always pops out at some point. Uh, six pounds for every pound spent on a Breathworks course. Um, and the savings were calculated as reductions to urgent and crisis health care and days absent from work. So it was both in the uh, health care settings as well as the overall um, Im impact on work. And then also from the report, um, so 114 studies showed consistent improvement in mental health and well-being for people with physical conditions. 43 studies showed improvement in mental health specifically for cancer patients, and other studies um, just beginning to show promising results for people with lower back pain, fibromyalgia, arthritis, HIV, and IBS. So we know also from our own research at Breathworks um, that mindfulness helped to improve the mental well-being of patients and their sense of being able to control their pain symptoms. So again, this sense of self-agency, um, being enabled to work creatively with un one's own symptoms, um, and that these improvements were related to changes in patterns of brain activity in regions involved with cognitive control and em emotional regulation. So just highlighting again the emphasis on pain not just being about tissue damage, but other things like thoughts and emotions. Um, another study uh, we've done at Breathwork showed that um, a mi mindfulness affected people's perception and management of their back pain um, with changes to participants' experience of pain and also um, supported a sense of wellness despite ongoing pain. So people, even though um, they may not have necessarily experienced decrease in their actual experience of pain, they uh, also had greater acceptance and better quality of life regardless of their experience of pain. So overall, just to keep hammering the point home, um, mindfulness showed reduced reduction in people's pain, some people's pain intensity, um, reduced interference with their daily life so they can get on with living their lives, reduced distress caused by their pain, um, a reduction in the rumin rumination that comes along with pain and their perceptions of helplessness, and improved activity, engagement, and overall quality of life. So this quote from the compendium, the greatest untapped resource is patients themselves. By supporting them to take control and manage their conditions better, we can slow, slow disease progression and reduce reliance on services. So just to say um, what we would love to have happen uh, at Breathworks. So um, the report does say that further research is needed um, to help highlight the impact of mindfulness on specific conditions rather than just generally to long-term conditions. Um, there's a lot more research that could be done around this link between mental health and physical health. Um, and we need more advocacy, particularly in the part of those of us involved in the field, but also our, our allies in other sectors, uh, specifically in the NHS, for monies um, to go into funding courses. Um, for example, the idea of courses on prescription. And this could be allied with pilot research studies to gather more comprehensive outcomes data. The report calls for definitive randomized control trials with full health economic evaluation of mindfulness programs for peeping, people living with a range of long-term physical health conditions. So at Breathworks, um, just to say we're already working on this kind of research with both our health, health and academic partners, um, and we're very keen to develop ongoing partnerships like these, uh, all as a step towards recognizing um, or towards the wider recognition of the benefits that we see on our own courses and towards provision of mindfulness courses through primary care. So I really want to ask just each of you to think uh, quite deeply, reflect on what you can do to help in this um, need for advocacy, research, <coughs> and implemented, uh, implementation of courses across uh, the healthcare system, because we all have a role to play in supporting mindfulness becoming more accessible to those who need it. Thank you.
Thank you for some history. Thank you. Um, so next up is Marcus again from Mind and Sulfur. Thank you. Yeah, again. Um, I'm going to keep mine brief because some of the uh, challenges that I'd already thought about have been mentioned by quite a few of the panel members already. Uh, my first one is delivery of good quality teacher training. Um, really important in the rollout of the recommendations for the Mindful Nation report. Um, and unfortunately there are some organisations out there who are, who are offering three or four day training courses and then people are kind of left to their own devices to go out and teach, which obviously is not the best kind of scenario we want to encourage. Um, and also mindfulness training that's affordable and accessible. I think that's a really important thing, it is for me anyway. Um, that we're not kind of just saying you have to be in a certain wage bracket or a certain part of society to be able to afford to be to be able to afford to train as a mindfulness teacher. Um, my second uh, challenge is uh, kind of convincing the powers that be uh, in all four program areas in the report that mindfulness is worth investing in as a long-term solution to, to issues. Um, and I was in uh, one of the big banks recently, I won't me mention the name, um, but I was there to deliver a mindfulness taster and um, to talk about mental health in the workplace and work-related stress. And uh, I sort of did the, the taster session and then so many people came from the staff group afterwards and said that they personally were experiencing work-related stress or a related mental health issue, um, or they knew somebody who was. Um, and when I went back to the bank afterwards and said, look, you know, this, 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 this number of people came forward and said they would like more mindfulness in the workplace, they said, well, we've got no money for it. So this is a big bank saying they've got no money, but anyway. Um, and, and that's the battle, I guess, we've got with the, the environment, the, um, the economic argument to say to people, well, if you invest in mindfulness in the workplace, you know, you will reduce absenteeism, it will increase pro productivity and creativity in the workplace, but it's kind of, they're not quite, in my experience, not quite at that, at that point yet. <clears throat> but also a big issue is stigma still, especially in the mental health field, that in this bank setting, people were coming forward and almost kind of surreptitiously still talking about their mental health behind screens. Um, and, um, you know, I was there to talk about mental health, I was invited to talk about mental health, but they still couldn't, they still didn't feel safe to do that in their working environment. Um, so I think stigma is a really big battle and obviously MIND have been doing the Time to Change campaign. Uh, but also MIND recently, you know, it's, it's still a massive problem that mental health in the workplace and um, stress-related illness in the workplace is a huge thing. MIND have done a, a, a survey recently in blue light workers and of those respondents, 87% of respondents said they'd experienced significant work-related stress, but found it hard to talk about mental health or stress in the workplace still. One in six people in the workplace has a diagnosable mental health problem in any one year. So it's still really hard to talk about. People are experiencing these things. And I, I sort of read um, a survey recently that said a lot of people in the workplace are kind of taking a day's holiday or a couple of days holiday because they'd rather do that than talk about work-related stress, which is why they're off, and be seen to be, to be weak, still in inverted commas. So it's still, a huge, it's still a huge issue, and I think a challenge that faces us with the implementation of the report in the, in the mental health field. Um, and finally, uh, something that's been kind of talked about already, Tim's alluded to it, and Jamie's alluded to it, um, is kind of mindfulness-based cognitive therapy is recognised by NICE as being uh, an intervention for relapse and depression. But um, we, we, we work with lots of people with lot, a huge, wide range of mental health issues. And it's how we engage with those people as well. Um, people that might not be suitable for an eight-week MBCT course. Um, so looking at how we develop uh, these gateways into, into mindfulness practice. We had a guy on one of our recent courses who um, had post-traumatic stress and we kind of sat down with him at, at length beforehand to see if he was okay to kind of engage with the course. <coughs> well, he couldn't do any of the longer practices. He couldn't do the 30-minute mind, mindful breathing or the 45-minute body scan. Um, and what we did with him in the end is he kind of downloaded an app on his phone that was just a gong that went off every hour on the hour during the day 
And it reminded him, he did the Fofbok practice, the feet on floor, body on chair. It was that simple. So for about 30 seconds, he would bring himself back to his present moment experience, not delving too much into, into his somatic experience in the body, but just those really simple things. And that had a profound effect on his, his presentation with post-traumatic stress as well. And then he started to see patterns and how he was trapped in those, those sort of um, cognitive, um, cognitive um, issues that he had. Um, so I think that's uh, some really important work to be done, and it sounds like Tim's doing some of that already. Um, and we're working, again, like I said, with City and Hackney Mind to see how we develop those uh, gateways, those gateway ideas into mindfulness for people uh, with a wide range of mental health issues. So that's me, short and sweet. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I'd like to introduce Geraldine Thomas again to talk about embedded mindfulness. Embedding mindfulness. So I'm going to give you a, a brief overview of, um, of how, how do we embed mindfulness. And I think it's quite a big question that, because there are lots of people have this perception that you can go on an eight-week course and then all of a sudden my life will be completely changed. I'll never experience any difficulties again. And you... So that's from a personal perspective. I've heard people t uh, talking about that. But also you have people in organisations which have the same mind state, so, or the mind mindset. Oh, we've just got to send the people on an eight-week course and, you know, everything will be fine. But for those of, of us who have actually walked along this journey we can we can understand that that simply doesn't happen um from my personal experience i, I must have gone on about eight or twelve eight week programs when they were offered in the local community i attended a for, uh, for the first two sessions couldn't deal with it went off i came back i came back i came back but, uh, but reflecting on that now, it actually shows to me that ability to come back, to come back. That was the cultivation of mindfulness actually starting. But for me, it was a, it was a long journey, and I had to come back, uh, come back. And um, I, <clears throat> this is an area that I feel I feel very passionate about because if we uh, uh, mindfulness, this capacity that every single one of us has to a certain degree, but uh, but something that we can all uh, cultivate and develop fur further. There is a great potential there, but the cultivation is the word. It needs to be cultivated over and over and over for this mental faculty to actually grow, to grow and develop. So I think organisations um, need to be really clear and understand about how do I embed this programme within an organisation, within, within, a, within a culture. So I'm going to ask you a question now. Has anybody in the audience ever put up a fence? <laughs> a fence. Anybody else? Fencing posts. Yeah. Yeah. So <clears throat> I've done that myself. So I'm going to share my experience with you of how do we actually put up a fencing post. Well, first of all, we have to dig the ground deep. We have to dig down deep until we hit a solid foundation. So we've got that solid foundation. And then we gently hold and support that post, guide that support, until we put the concrete around and gently support it into, until the concrete takes hold. And that post is completely embedded within, within the, the concrete. <laughs> So that, that is my understanding of mindfulness. Us as teachers, you know, we, we need to ask, ask ourselves, um, or, you know, am I, uh, am I experienced enough to be working with this client base? Or do I really fundamentally and experientially understand what mindfulness is? Um, and then if we don't, we need to go back to our practice and develop that d deep knowledge, that deep wisdom for, for us to actually then to, to, go, to go forward. Um, for me to actually start teaching was probably about 13 years. So um, 
13 years before I thought, you know, I, I, could, I could share my experience and I could actually teach what, uh, somebody how to start to practice mindfulness. So the firm fen the fencing post and, and that, the, the foundation, the solid foundation and the support. And this is how we nurture and grow mindfulness how it grows, how it nurtures, how it develops, and how it actually em embeds within, within ourselves. And when we fundamentally understand that, we, that then enables us to, to go forward and work uh, to actually embed mindfulness in you know, organisations or wherever you're working. It's not just, it's not good enough just to go in and just do a short course and then off you go. Um, my way of, uh, of working with this, it, it's, it's having long-term relationships with the organisations that you are working in, listening to them, offering supervision, coming back again and again, because you do go off the rails. You, <laughs> you do go back to habitual patterns. And this is, this is the support that you need as, as you're moving along this journey. So I just want to finish uh, by saying um, what happens if we, we don't have that solid foundation, if we don't dig deep and find solid ground. We just put that fe fencing post half the way down and then we chuck a bit of concrete round it and then, fingers crossed, we'll have a, a, a strong upright post. What happens? That post begins to bend. bend. So then on that post, when we at attach our fence... We've got a wonky fence. So we're already starting from that wonky fence. So this is exactly the same. If we are going in and we're teaching people, we don't have that foundation, what, what are we doing to them? We're a, lot of, a lot of the time, what we are doing is just spreading our own confusion. So then that person, that's their a point of reference for them to, to this is mindfulness. And it's been taught uh, <clears throat> in a way that confuses. And then that confusion just goes off into some sort of trajectory. So embedding, embedding mindfulness, hugely important. Mindfulness is a very special, unique quality that we all have, but it just doesn't happen by just flicking on, flicking on a switch or um, we need to cultivate it, we need to nurture it, we need to grow it. Okay. Thank you, John. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So I'd like to welcome uh, Dr. Peter Malknowski, uh, Senior Lecturer in Psychology and Cognitive Neuroscience at Liverpool John Rawls University. Yeah. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. So, um, Markus invited me to primarily speak from a researcher perspective. Um, I hope you're still open for a bit of science. <laughs> so, but actually, I'm, I'm not only a researcher, a scientist, I'm also a meditation practitioner, I'm a meditation teacher, I'm a lecturer. So, kind of all this comes together. And Markus also asked me to talk about some of the key challenges that I see in this field. I think we've already heard about a few challenges. Um, one challenge, and I decided just to focus on one, I could also focus on different ones, but one, and then I tried to, to talk a little bit about the, the research perspective on it. And um, for me, actually, and this, I think we heard it throughout also, um, one of the big questions is, what actually do we implement? Yeah. So um, this is not only, in itself, not only a question of implementation, but of course it is related to what are we researching? Yeah. So if I focus my research, let's say, on one particular program that is, that is implemented, then I will only get evidence for this program, right? So, and this gives a certain tra trajectory to the whole field. Yeah. So. It also relates to the question, what um, do mindfulness teachers, what are they trained in? What do they learn? If I focus on a specific 
program, this will be the trajectory. You know? So, and, and I see this as a, as a challenge for, um, uh, to, to consider this for several reasons, and one of the reasons is that actually um, here in the U UK, but even more so internationally, more and more people are coming to me saying, I'm not, I don't feel 100% at home to li limit my practice just to MBSR, MBCT. And I think if we look at the uh, first session we had today, actually there was this strong feeling that we need to adapt things in, in, in different ways, to different contexts, to different situations, and, and so on. So when we look at the, so w when I try to go into the, the evidence, yeah, the nitty gritty, really looking at what is the empirical evidence, so then the so far, regarding the mindfulness provision that is out, out there, the question which mindfulness programs are the right one to implement hasn't been directly addressed. Yeah? So this actually, we, we don't really have an answer to it. If, if we look um, probably historically, there are good reasons why M MBSR developed first and why it developed in particularly this case, yeah, given, given the situation John covered in uh, John covered in was, was in and, and so on, that uh, the reasons why it is eight, week, eight weeks long and, and so on. And I think we have to be incredibly grateful that all these developments have taken place because otherwise probably we wouldn't even be together here now. Right? But uh, what I see now is actually maybe we have to look more widely and say actually what are other ap approaches. Yeah? So, um, so I try to look for studies, and as I said, no studies really, and meta-analysis in particular, address this, this, these related questions directly. But there's some uh, indirect evidence. And one study here, Carmody and Bear, for instance, um, looking at the effect on MBSR on, on psychological distress, not in a clinical population, but in more general uh, pop, uh, populations and what they sh they show in a meta-analysis. First of all, there is not so much robust evidence, so this also makes it a little bit doubtful how strong this evidence is. But this is all we have at the moment. Yeah, so there is no relationship between the contact time and the treatment effect. So how how much the people improved in terms of psychological stress? How, how much the participants improved? There is no relation between the amount of home practice and the treatment effect. So we're saying actually, yeah, eight, eight week program, whatever, two, two weeks per day, six hour retreat and some, or something like this, and 30 to 45 minutes of practice. The evidence is not there. There's also no evidence that this is not the right thing. One should also say, yeah, so it's, yeah, but there, so there's, from the scientist perspective, I would say th that there's not, the evidence that the program has to look exactly like this is not there. Yeah? So, from an experiential perspective, it might be quite different, but we also heard some reference to science, why, um, why we should do things like this. Yeah? So, another study, the second one, Everett and Sedelmeier, they com compared MBSR what, to what they called pure mindfulness approaches. Basically, uh, studies that investigated, for instance, individual meditation practices that, that are usually part of MBSR. Yeah? So not the standard uh, eight-week program, but, but a, a range of different um, approaches. What they found is, first of all, MBSR was most powerful um, in increasing well-being, psychological well-being in particular. But when looking at the effects on what, what they term mindfulness variables, so where we say which is an an indicator of mindfulness as closely as possible. You know? Simple things would be changes in, in um, ver uh, responses on, on the mindfulness questionnaire, but also other things more related to the attentional abilities and things like this. They found actually that such pure mindfulness uh, programs are um, cr uh, better in improving um, these close mindfulness variables than MBSR. And one conclusion one could draw from it, but it's also indirect in a way, is that actually what happens in MBSR is not only mindfulness, but also other things, yeah, like the, the, the group structure and the, the social support and all this that takes, takes place, yeah, which is not a problem, but probably something to be aware of as well. Yeah. And then 
Uh, another uh, meta-analysis looked at the, the role or the influence of, of home practice. Yeah? And again, there are limited data and uh, some ha roughly half of the studies, they show that the amount the people practice has influence at practice at home, the, the amount the participants practice has an influence, and the other half of the study shows it doesn't have an influence on the outcome. Yeah? So, um, and when they drilled a little bit deeper, it doesn't go much deeper because the, the uh, database is li the, the amount of data is limited. But where, they, the, where these positive links were found, this was particularly when when the participants came either from the uh, Health, health care sector somehow, or if they were self-referred. So the kind of interpretation was that actually if there already is a um, kind of understanding or interest in mindfulness and so on, and the a neg no link or negative link even was, was found in, in cases where, for instance, this was um, go given to corporate employees, healthy adults, non-medical students, and, and studies that looked at this. Yeah? So when, when looking at, um, at these, these data, I would say, actually, MBSR, MBCT, there's evidence out there that is uh, effective, but uh, we can't be sure that exactly the way it is delivered, eight weeks, two hours, you, you name it, you all, you all know this, this is the most effective way. The, the data we have so far don't show it. And so, so, so I would say, there's no good reason to, as, to assume that we should only train MBSR, MBCT. There's no good reason to assume that we should only um, investigate MBSR, MBCT. And actually, I, I would think that a more balanced approach that actually also uh, acknowledges that there ca can be very different approaches, yeah? that, that this is actually much needed now. And I would really hope that, that the field doesn't stay that narrow, that only funding is only given in, in this very cor corridor, so this would actually mean that nothing else can be um, demonstrated if no money is there for other approaches, and also that, that other tr uh, training approaches are, are possible as well. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Dr. Peter Morgan, who's a clinical psychologist at the Pennine Care NHS Foundation Trust and mindfulness teacher. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So, yeah, two Peters for the price of one. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, I'm hoping to talk to you today in a very short space of time about challenges about implementation in the NHS and a bit about staff wellbeing in the NHS as well. So, I'm not going to try and give a comprehensive overview because I think that's impossible, but I'm going to say a little bit on those topics. Um, Jamie mentioned about the, uh, the Aspire study that's been going on. It started in 2009 uh, and was looking at how is MBCT in particular, MBCT for depression, but also what else is going on in the NHS. Uh, how is this being implemented? How's it going? Uh, and what kind of challenges are people facing? What kind of things uh, have worked well? What kind of issues have they hit? Um, they published a paper in 2013 which uh, explored whether they were up to that point. It's actually um, open access so anyone can get to that. So uh, it's called the Implementation of MBCT, Learning from the UK Health Service Experience. So I'd welcome you to, to seek that out if you want a lot of in-depth information. They also at that point produced some implementation guidelines. Um, so it's quite a big document which goes through all, all sorts of different things which are helpful in terms of on a local level trying to implement MBCT. So it goes through the evidence base, it goes through what's involved, what might the, the setup might look like in terms of referral pathways, inclusion criteria. So it's quite a comprehensive document that was put together. Um, where the study's up to now, uh, they're at the point of dissemination about the, the various findings that they've got. Um, and as Jamie mentioned, there's um, a workshop tomorrow, which is down in Oxford. There's one in Bangor next month. Uh, and we've just, in the last couple of days, scheduled one that's going to happen in the northwest on the 22nd of April. So if anyone's particularly interested in uh, what's come out of that study and the, the kind of implementation and uh, the, the way that they've looked at it in different sites around the country, 
I'll leave over there at the end a, a sign-up sheet for information, really. We can send out uh, the details as it comes through. So far, we've just got the date uh, just in the last couple of days, but it's going to be quite a small event. 35 or so people can attend, so it might be about individuals from organisations coming and then feeding back in, but hopefully that will be a really useful event to, to kind of see what's been going on. So to, to just kind of give you a real quick nutshell, you know, what, what's involved in that, it's a lot of the things that have already come up throughout the day, really. Um, in particular, things like it really relying so far on champions in, in areas. So people are really passionate, making the case, lobbying, <coughs> presenting the evidence. Um, very much a bottom-up development. Uh, quite often a lack of organi organisational support in lots of different ways, sometimes just not being given the time to do it, um, but not ac giving access to training or supervision. All sorts of different barriers in that way. And particularly at the moment, we're hitting a problem in terms of uh, the overall pressure that there is on the NHS, but also on IAP services. So they're the kind of primary care services uh, for mental health at the moment. And really, there's a huge pressure on targets, getting a certain throughput of people through those services and showing very specific uh, improvements on certain measures. Uh, and really, in some ways, mindfulness can fit within that if it's, do if it's sort of if it's packaged in the right way, way it can sit in an IAP service. Uh, but it, in, in many other ways, it's kind of countercultural at the moment to come in and uh, be looking more broadly at well-being and looking more broadly at life experience and the value that this gives, uh, rather than on quite a specific, um, sort of quick and easy way that we're moving towards in mental health at the moment. So I think it's, it's not that it can't be done, but I think there are many challenges. My experience over the last two years has been going into a service where there wasn't any mindfulness provision, developing and setting up a service that provides MBCT, provides MBSR and works with schools and colleges and other organisations, as well as staff wellbeing. So, um, yeah, I'll be happy to talk to people or answer questions on that, but I won't go into to detail at this point about that. Um, so in terms of staff wellbeing, I think there's a huge role for mindfulness and supporting healthcare workers um, and really all of us, but specifically about this area of healthcare provision. Um, there's really good examples of work done in this area. So um, in Lancashire Care, uh, NHS Trust, people who self-identified as stressed attended mindfulness courses, uh, specifically MBCT, it was adapted for stress. And over 100 people attended these courses. The overall results showed um, that the number of uh, sick days that people took if you took the year before they attended the course and the year after they attended the course, it dropped from an average of 20 days to an average of five days. So a hugely significant change in that respect. You've got to be careful with data like that because there are other facts involved and other things going on. But just as a kind of headline figure, that's the sort of stuff that's possible potentially um, with this as an intervention for staff who are stressed. However, um, it really must be done in such a way that we don't place blame on individuals or responsibility on individuals um, so that it's up completely up to them to stay well and to be uh, in good health. And again, that's been touched on in different ways um, throughout this today. Um, it's really important that part of how we work with individuals must be to acknowledge the context in which they're working um, so that we're not pretending that teaching mindfulness to frontline staff would somehow offset a toxic environment so that we're both supporting people to be resilient and to, uh, to look after themselves and it can be really helpful in tough situations where there's um, issues with change in organisations or uh, just a really busy work environment, a difficult, uh, a difficult thing to provide really healthcare, the amount of exposure to distress and to, uh, to vulnerability that's there in that sort of setting. So I think it's really important that what we do is we do provide mindfulness for frontline staff but equally what we're looking at is applying mindfulness at all levels in organisations so that the way in which the organisation operates, the way in which it treats staff, reflects this idea of compassion, of kindness, uh, of openness, of awareness. And really that's just as important as anything that we do on the ground um, for, the, for the sort of frontline staff. And yeah, and I really like some of the themes that have come up today about, uh, about community and about uh, embedding and I think that fits really well in the healthcare context that this is something that has real potential there actually to change the way that we deliver services, um, what we expect from staff 
and how we actually change this idea that uh, seeking help, seeking help as NHS staff is somehow weak or is somehow, uh, you know, we should all just carry on and keep going. Um, and all, exactly the same for all of us in this room, really. We all sit under different guises of whether we're providers of this kind of work or commissioners or uh, managers or, you know, people who have experienced different things and come to mindfulness. We're all in that bracket, really. It's so important that we don't somehow opt out and suggest that this isn't for us too, that we, we also somehow shouldn't look after ourselves. You know, it's just as important that we take care of ourselves too. So if we can encourage organisations to take that on board um, and work with people at all level of organisations, potentially what we could do is um, something really helpful for where the NHS is at at the moment because, you know, report after report comes out about um, a whole workforce that is stressed, higher than average sickness absence. And it's not that we've got lots of people working in these organisations that are somehow flawed. Uh, we really need to look at the culture as much as we look at helping individuals. So I think that's all I wanted to say. Does it, well, it's not all I wanted to say, but it's all I was going to say in a, a short <laughs> space of time. Uh, but thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter. To welcome our last panel uh, speaker this afternoon, uh, Helen Regan Addis, who is director of the Mindfulness Association <coughs> and also convener for the UK network of teacher training organisations. One of the things that's um, really uh, occurred to me during the course of the afternoon <coughs> is how collaborative the mindfulness um, community has been in the on party parliamentary group in the arrangement of this event, all the local people getting together, and you all coming here as well, and how so much of this is done on a voluntary basis. And I'm here as uh, the current convener of the UK network of mindfulness teacher training organisations, which again is a collaborative network of people who volunteer their time. And the challenge that we've been looking at is governance in this field that um, the, you know, this, we're gradually getting a little bit more regulation. The UK network has been meeting for about 10 years. My organisation, the Mindfulness Association, has been involved for the last seven years. So I've attended the meeting for the last seven years. And we meet together in crew, actually, um, for about two and a half days. And we kind of surface any issues that are alive in the in the field and then we spend a half day practicing together and it's amazing how that practicing together enables us to kind of then um, collaborate in finding out what's needed rather than kind of putting each organization specific wants to the foreground and the, the main motivation behind all of us at the UK network is that we're really wanting to promote good quality teacher trainers uh, teacher trainings so that there are really high quality teachers out there teaching excellent courses. So our, our website is there, it's there at the end as well. All the information that you want to know about the network is there. And we're a network of the kind of main mindfulness teacher training organisations in the UK and we include the universities, so Oxford, Exeter, Bangor University, Aberdeen University, which is the course I work on. And um, also several NHS trusts, other wonderful organisations represented here, so Breathworks, um, Integrated Mindfulness, which is Tim's organisation, Mindflow, Geraldine's organisation, and my organisation, which is the Mindfulness Association. So we come together there and have come together here for this event as well. Um, we're concerned with the governance of those teaching eight-week courses there's lots of mindfulness, really, isn't there? You know, from, from mindfulness apps, self-help books, to long-term retreats. But our main focus, so far anyway, has been eight-week courses. And, and the courses that we we're kind of um, have a, uh, um, are included in the UK guidelines at the minute, um, the main ones anyway, are mindfulness-based stress reduction, mindfulness-based cognitive therapy, and a couple of derivatives from that, the Breathworks eight-week course training, and the Mindfulness Association's Mindfulness-Based Living course. So, one of the first things that we did 
was generate the UK Good Practice Guidelines for Mindfulness Teachers in, a, in the context where people were reading a book and then teaching a course. Or, or you know, staff, maybe NHS staff were doing an eight-week course and then being expected to teach it straight away. So really we wanted a piece of paper that people could go and wave at their managers to say, look, you know, this, this, this organisation says that you, you, know, you really need to... I really need to be having this kind of training in order to be able to teach mindfulness. And so the guidelines set out what a, a minimum training pathway might look like, you know, the, the requirements of a teacher training pathway, what additional requirements are needed. So if you're teaching clinical populations, you need experience in that. If you're working with particular groups, you need prior experience of working with those kind of groups, or at least be working with someone who has that. And then... As mindfulness teachers, it's not that we just do the teacher training course and teach the course. You know, mindfulness is, our li is a you know, big part of our lives. And so there's ongoing requirements. So we need to maintain our practice, have regular supervision, and continually um, develop our knowledge and experience in the field. And also regular retreats are considered to be important. And these are the things that as a, a group of people who had experience of training teachers, these are the things that we thought were important to be included. So, <coughs> <coughs> the other thing that we developed was a set of good practice guidelines for the trainers of mindfulness teachers and organisations that want to join the UK network um, adhere to these guidelines. So all their trainers of teachers adhere to the trainer guidelines and they train their teachers in accordance with the teacher guidelines. And uh, Jamie said earlier about pinching yourself, didn't you? I mean, we have a UK listing of mindfulness teachers that um, is now up and running. And I have to pinch myself as well that we've actually managed to, to achieve this. So this is for mindfulness teachers in the UK who are trying to teach one of those eight-week courses, who can demonstrate that they meet all the requirements of the good practice <coughs> guidelines, they have insurance, and they have taught at least two eight-week courses under supervision. And if they do that, they can apply online. Um, if any of you are thinking of applying, the recommendation is that you fill in the Word version of the application form and go through it with your supervisor first to make sure the application is likely to be accepted. Because if it's rejected, there's no refund. Um, <laughs> fill in the application form online. There's a payment of £90, then an annual renewal process with an annual renewal fee of £37.50. Um, and this is the first time, so the UK network has kind of had any, anything to do with kind of people being paid for the work that they're doing. So it's kind of a bit of a departure for us. When the applications come in, um, they're checked uh, initially, and then they're sent to a referee. So when you make your application, you select someone, hopefully someone who's been involved in your teacher training, to, to validate your application. And then... Um, the application goes out to the referee, who will be a teacher trainer in one of the organisations that's part of the network. And then they verify that you know, what you've said on your application form is, is, is correct. And they verify that you meet the UK practice guidelines and have taught the courses under supervision. So, of course, um, we have a website, and the, the listing is now on the website. Um, and once your application is accepted, you're automatically shown there. Um, it, it indicates which course you're trained to teach. So you can, you can say which course you want, you're looking for, like MBCT, MBSR, whatever. And then, then like a map of England comes up and you can see what teachers there are in your area. Because what we're really wanting to do is enable commissioners and the general public to be able to find a suitably qualified mindfulness teacher that's close to them and that teaches the course that they're interested in taking part in. And if you need any information, it's on our website. And these are the email addresses if um, you, have, well, you want to get in touch. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, Heather. Um, well, the panel of speakers have done a wonderful job of making time up. We're, we're at 10 to 5, and we had about uh, 
uh, a 10 to 15 minute Q&A followed by a five minute concluding address from Geraldine. So we might run over by about five minutes if people are generally okay with that. Um, and Sinkeshri, you're going to facilitate the uh, yeah. Q&A? Um, hi, thank you. I'm from Leeds and I'm in many ways um, your ideal commissioner. I'm a doctor, I've got a psychology degree, I'm a mindfulness practitioner and I'm going to do the teacher training. And I just wonder for other people in my position how, um, how the commissioning tools progress is coming along, please. <laughs> so, does anyone want to take that one? <laughs> You might have stumped us all there. Yeah. <laughs> so in the um, in the report it says the UK teachers group um, Heather are working on a commissioning tool toolkit. Not so far as I'm aware. Uh, yeah. Well, I'm happy to help support the development. Okay. Thank you. Mm. Um, and just uh, building on that, I was asked earlier about um, how the commissioning for pain might change. Um, and I'd like to mention that, it, that there's a really important role for service users or anyone in the community to, to write to and lobby their clinical commissioning groups, their trusts. I'm, I'm told it's a really powerful way to bring about change. So, um, uh, yeah, as well as a toolkit for uh, commissioners, I think we should have a toolkit for advocates. Yeah, I think as well that, um, I mean, the, the whole one of the main purposes of the, of the listing is to make it clear to commissioners, you know, what teachers there are in their area. I don't know whether that was what the report was referring to, possibly. Yeah. Well, let's, let's definitely talk afterwards if you're able to hang around for a moment. Just, just to follow up on that point, um, you, you mentioned, Jane, the devolution in Manchester. Um, and I think it would be useful if you could circulate information about how people can get engaged in that debate about how to influence future delivery of health and social care in Greater Manchester, because I still think it's very widely unknown about what's going to happen, how it's going to change, I don't know. But if there's opportunities for people to feed their views in and to actually influence at a very early stage how mindfulness is delivered in the future, Greater Manchester, sorry about everybody else in the North West, but in Greater Manchester, that'd be really good. Yeah, yeah we, we've launched mindfulness initiatives in uh, the Welsh Assembly and in Northern mm -hmm. Ireland and we'll be doing something similar in Edinburgh. So rather than launching the report, we're actually sort of launching new processes. And it might be that there needs to be a process in Manchester led by kind of local associates of the, uh, of the um, Mindfulness Initiative, perhaps. Okay, other questions? Yeah. Sorry. Hi, my name's Karen Rice, and I'm a CBT therapist from Bolton. Um, I think one of the things that I thought mindfulness is premised on is that idea that suffering is an inevitable part of us being human mm -hmm. and that mindfulness is one of the ways of us attempting to acknowledge and then deal with and manage that suffering that's an inevitable part of us being human beings. But one of the things that I think the speakers have referred to on a number of occasions is how a significant amount of the suffering that we suffer in the world currently isn't natural or automatic but it's part of the toxic environment in which we live be it where we work or particularly people with long-term conditions the horrible way that they're treated by the government that um, are in terms of the horrible way they're spoken about as workers and shirkers or the benefit system or anything else and I wondered whether there was any research about as people were more in tune with that suffering and that hurt whether it affected their ability to resist the part of their suffering that isn't automatic, that isn't sort of necessary, but is something that's generated by political decisions. Mm. I've got a sort of answer to that. I'm not sure if it's direct, but uh, so some of my experience has been working with NHS staff uh, who've self-identified as stressed. And one of the outcomes of some of the groups that people attended was actually that people woke up to their circumstance, mm -hmm. became more aware of the distress that they were in, more aware of the difficulties they were facing that weren't their fault effectively. And actually some people, um, it then led them to making changes in their local working environment in terms of talking more to managers about their situation. Some people left their jobs. Mm -hmm. And actually, I don't know if that's sort of relevant to what you're saying directly, but that feeling of, for whoever it is there as an individual, change might be what's needed. Yeah. 
if we're trying to build firm foundations, if we're building sandcastles and the waves are washing them down every time one comes in, maybe that's not the place to, to be. I think that's a great question. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Hi, um, I think this question is for Heather. My name's Jill Edmondson. I've spoken to you before. It's just interesting about the register. So I deliver teacher training <coughs> programs, as I've mentioned with you, I follow your guidelines. So I've not joined the register myself yet with it being so new. But so for my students to to join the network, does it ha do they have to have followed a course from the UK network, or is it okay if they they've um, took the training with a with an organisation that follows your guidelines? Have they? Is it is it one of the courses? Is it MBS? The MBSR. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Well, that, that that should be okay. Should be okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Question. Great, thank you. So, um, looks like we're on time. Geraldine's. Amazing. I know. <laughs> Marcus and I were talking, I just said, My word, that's absolutely amazing. So, so uh, we're going to hand over to Geraldine to uh, conclude. Well, I'm uh, not going to keep you for, for very long. Um, it's been a, an absolute amazing day, and I. Uh, there's so much going on up here, but I am aware of it. So much that I've heard. Um, this, uh, the, it's been inspirational. And um, I would have never have thought in a million years that mindfulness would be where it is today with so much interest. But there is a need out there globally. The suffering seems to be so, so intense. Everybody I speak to, I make a point of speaking to people, so everybody from from the gardener to somebody high up, some CEO, the level of stress is unbelievable. I, I was doing some, well, a workshop in uh, Unilever and... Um, there was one chap and he he was coming up to retirement and he he said to me this is what all these youngsters need he said he can't he couldn't stand working in the environment that the youngsters are coming into now he says they just can't step off constant 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 but it's the pressures that 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 are put on them um, and and he he said he was so glad to be coming coming to retirement now, um, because of you know the the levels of stress and a lot of the time inability to 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 cope with that stress. Stress is uh, part and parcel of life. We we need a certain amount of stress, but when that stress uh, tips one way. That is very detrimental to us. So it's finding the balance. It's finding the balance. And it's working with challenges. A lot of the time, we can't, um, you know, we can't do anything about the external. So we're in our work environment or whatever. We've got this target, that's, that report to do, blah, blah, blah. We, we can't uh, change the external, but what we can do through mindfulness is change our way of relating to it so it doesn't actually impact on us in, in such a, a negative and detrimental way to our health and well-being and to our relationships, not just our work relationships, but our family relationships. So it's very much an inter interrelated uh, approach. If we can look after our, ourselves and, and simple, uh, just, just coming into the moment, just taking a breath, before we have to step on again, we develop these habits, these habits. And if we do that, coming back again and again over a long time, uh, we develop a, a resilience to, to work with uh, difficulty and suffering because it'll be there. There's no, no beginning and no end to it, but it's how we work with it is, is important. So um, 
That's all I want to say on that. Um, we've had some amazing uh, speakers, so I'd like to thank to thank them all, organisations, people that um, new to me I haven't met, and that's, that's been wonderful actually coming here and seeing the level of, of in interest acro across the border. So I'd like to uh, thank Salford University for this uh, amazing uh, venue um, and all our speakers and the host of organisations, Breath Breathworks uh, and Mind in Salford. Um, it's been really good actually work, working together in this collaborative way. I've been really pressurised with work, so I felt a little guilty at times that I've been pushing it on onto Marcus and James, but they've been absolutely amazing, and it, it's it's been wonderful working working to up to this day. So. Um, I think that's all I need to say. And, and a massive thank you to, to yourselves for actually coming here and making this uh, event possible uh, and to see the level of interest and for you to go, to go forward as well. So um, thank you. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Joey. Okay, that concludes today. If you do need to get any contact details, then we're all going to be around for a few minutes, so uh, please do that. Thanks for coming. Cheers. Thanks.